Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Belinda Thomas and I'm the National Program Manager from NEABPD Australia. And we're very happy to be presenting our webinar for BPD Awareness Week tonight. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. And I begin today by respectfully acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we all gather and meet recognising the continuing living culture of First Nations people across Australia. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land where I stand. I pay respect to First Nation elders past and present and extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be attending this webinar today. Thank you and welcome to everyone. We'd like to note the date change for this event and offer our appreciation for your understanding and ability to accommodate the last minute shift. We're gonna start off with just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you'll notice that you're all on mute that will remain for the whole webinar. We are recording this session, uh, which will be available next week and I uh, or someone else from the team will email you a link to our YouTube channel for the video that's on there. Uh, we ask that you leave the chat until directed. We'll be having some questions throughout the webinar sprinkled um, throughout. Jenny will ask some questions and there'll be some space um, to pop your answers in. And some of them, uh, some of your uh, questions will be will be selected to be read out, but with the high volume of people, we won't be able to answer everybody's question directly. Um, and uh, time permitting, we may be able to have a little bit of time at the end for some more questions and answers. So tonight we are thrilled to be presenting an introduction to some relational DBT skills called Walking the Middle Path delivered by Jenny Fitzharding. Jenny is one of our highly valued Family Connections leaders. She is a clinical counsellor and a DBT therapist. She has been leading Family Connections groups since 2015 and Lifeline's DBT team groups, which is Dialectical Behavioural Therapy for Adolescents and their parents since 2020. So without further ado, over to you, Jenny. Okay. Uh, all right, welcome everyone. I'm um, talking to you from Wajat Noongar country, which is uh, Perth, Western Australia. Um, again, thank you for accommodating the change. I really appreciate it. Um, so I just want to share my screen. And, um, okay, all right. So walking the middle path. This is uh, a unit that was specifically developed for um, the multifamily group program that is run out of, uh, that was initially run out of New York and now is um, a program that's run uh, all over America and the, and the world. And it took adult DBT and developed it for um, multi-family groups which is uh, in the pure model you would have a young person and both parents would attend the group with other families and they would learn the skills alongside each other. Uh, uh, the group that um, I, I'm a co-facilitator for uh, which is run by Lifeline WA we have uh, a young person and one parent just because of numbers. We, we want to get as many families in as we can and we just can't accommodate um, two parents. Um, and fewer, fewer families as a whole get to go through. So, um, and what they found in running just pure DBT was that there were particular problems that were unique to um, families of adolescents with um, either borderline personality disorder or emerging um, you know, emerging emotional unstable personality disorder and other other disorders where emotional dysregulation, high impulsivity, those sorts of 
behaviours that are problematic. Jenny, sorry yes. to interrupt. A few people are saying are having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. I seem to be hearing you fine, but I'm not sure um, about others. Could you have a quick check of your sound settings? It's very quiet, people are saying. Okay, it might be me just mumbling. Is it clearer when I when I project a bit better? Clearer. Mm. It is very quiet. Um, I can try. I've, I have got headphones, but I find sometimes they're not clearer. But we can we can certainly give it a go. Give it a go. Um, I find it's It's um. I find it's a bit um. Temperamental. Okay. Let's but give it a shot. Give it a shot. Yeah, so so just while I unravel my incredibly long headphones. Um, yeah, so do so so this is yeah, this is a, a unit that is, is particularly uh, for families, but it's also um, has been incorporated into the adult program as well. Okay, how are we going? Fantastic. That sounds good to me. Is that good, everyone? Is that better for people? Sounds weirder for me. You know, I might leave one out so at least I feel human. Much Does that... better. Much better. Yes, much better. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for your feedback, everybody. Thanks. For some reason, the chat's just popped up on my screen. I don't want to see that. Okay. Um, I'm going to be ignoring the chat. So. Um, yeah, there's someone in the waiting room. Okay, all right, so uh, getting back on, why is it doing that now? Okay, all right, so what is DBT? I'm going to assume that many of you don't know. I'm also just going to, sorry, I'm just going to do one thing to make it easier for me to focus. And that is, yeah, that's better. Okay, so, so dialectical behaviour therapy is um, so-called because being dialectical is a big part of it. And dialectics is basically a philosophy that assumes fundamental truths about reality, one being that everything is connected to everything else. So what I do impacts on you and what you do impacts on me and the systems that are around us impact on us. You know, it's not... I think there's a dialogue that happens a lot around mental health in our system that puts a lot of the responsibility on the person who has the mental health to get better, the mental health issues to get better. And um, a dialectical stance would say, actually, everything impacts on everything else. So we don't just make it the individual's problem. It's the family's problem. It's, it's the system's problem. It's you know the health system and so on. So the other assumption that's fairly uh, core to DBT is that uh, change is constant and inevitable and that when and also that when we consider two opposites, two things that can seem to be opposite, we can actually arrive at a greater truth. So an example of that might be um, I'm doing the best I can and I can do better. So, you know, if you, if you say, you know, certainly when people are struggling, you know, you might say, look, you can do, you should be doing better. You should, you know, or, or the way that we can talk to ourselves is I, I should be a better parent. I really, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this well, you know, and, and we sort of make ourselves all bad. But if we can sort of go, actually, I am really trying to do the best I can and I can do better, that is a more useful truth. It's, it's a bigger thing. So um, if we can sort of move from these sort of polarised um, positions, then we can arrive at a greater truth. Now, dialectical behaviour therapy itself is based on um, humanistic therapies, which, which focus on acceptance. So this is thinking about, you know, that we're all inherently good people trying to do the best we can. And 
the cognitive and behavioural schools, which emphasise the need to change, and, I, and DBT sits in the middle. Um, it, DBT was actually started from a cognitive behavioural stance, but people um, that Marsha Linehan, who created this um, program, was working with, found it to be really um, invalidating. They found that, you know, it felt like they were being told that they were, um, you know, that everything was wrong with them and that kind of often might have tied in with their own self-story as well. And it was, you know, just made them, I mean, what happens when you get told that you're wrong? Most of us will get defensive. So it made it hard to change. So she sort of switched over to being accepting and they were like, oh, it's great to be understood. It's wonderful, you know, that you get my problems but hey, things need to change for me and aren't you going to help me change? So DBT tries to do this, this dance between, being, between acceptance on the one hand and it teaches people mindfulness, it teaches people distress tolerance skills so that when you're in a situation which can't be changed and is distressing, you can at least survive it and change skills. And these change skills are particularly focused on how you manage your emotions and um, you know how you might manage your relationships. So, so, so there's this constant dance between asking people to change and and encouraging them to accept themselves. So, you know that core dialectic is I accept myself. I am actually okay. You know I am doing the best I can, and I need to change. So both things can be true at the same time. This is what dialectics is. And, and, the, and its focus is on behavioural change. So, um, you know, Marsha Linehan says, you can't think yourself into new ways of acting. You can only act yourself into new ways of thinking. So, um, so that's, that's a snapshot of what DBT is. It was created for people um, initially with with borderline personality disorders. Now, sometimes that's referred to as emotionally unstable personality disorder, but it's also been found to be effective with people with substance abuse disorders, eating disorders, suicidality, depressive and anxiety disorders, ADHD, uh, PTSD. I presume it's got related to childhood sexual abuse because that was the study that, that we're citing here. Uh, bipolar disorder, and pre-adolescent children with emotional and behavioural dysregulation. So that's, uh, again, working in a multifamily groups. So the a core assumption of DBT is that people have problems because they don't have the skills to deal with it, with, you know, with what's happening in their lives and so on. Um, or if they have the skills, they don't really know how to use, when to use them or how to use them effectively. And so they use maladaptive skills. So, you know, self-harming, cutting is, a, you know, a big issue and it's a very distressing issue for families. Um, but another DBT assumption is that, you know, every behaviour has a cause or um, is a reason behind why we do things. And one of the reasons that, you know, cutting is something that people will do, for example, is because it actually is effective at, man at a at regulating emotions it will change their emotions it will give some kind of relief um, so the emphasis on dbt in dbt is to find other forms of relief to distressing emotions and other ways of changing um, emotions that are not negative that are not maladaptive so um, yeah it's about learning skills and applying them well so um, again, just giving you this sort of um, overview of uh, DBT and what we're what we're working towards. I feel like I'm going to finish this in about half an hour. I'm going so fast. If I'm too fast, I'll slow down. Um, so going back to that thing about thinking about people not having the skills to deal with. Um, their life and their, and their circumstances. Um, an analogy that I'll use, it's like, a, like, like, the, like the person's um, emotional system, let's call it, is like a sports car. It's highly powered. 
it's highly reactive, you know, and this particular sports car has faulty brakes and inaccurate steering. So you can just imagine if you took out a car on the Mitchell Freeway and it's got it's kind of accelerator kind of surges at unexpected times and the brakes are not working properly, someone's going to have an accident, right? So DVT comes in and says, look, you know, there's skills for that. We're going to fix the brakes, we're going to fix the steering, and we might have a look at that surgy accelerator. Now the person's still going to be, is still going to have a sports car for an emotional system. It's still going to be powerful. It's still going to be reactive, but they're going to be able to manage it better. So what this might look like um, is take two people. So we talk about having an emotional baseline. And I'm going to tell you a story now about um, Mr. Green, who's very, very chill, doesn't, doesn't let much get to him, has a very calm way of being. And Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown is highly sensitive to emotional stimuli. He, when he does get an emotional stimulus, he reacts really strongly. And then he actually struggles to come back down to baseline. So Mr. Brown and Mr. Green are both driving to work and um, somebody pulls out in front of them and they have to put the brakes on. Mr. Green's kind of like, oh, oh, okay, that was a bit of a shock. But, you know, doesn't get too upset about it because, you know, it's this kind of thing happens on the way to work. Mr. Brown's like, well, that idiot. What are they trying to cause an accident? Are they going to make it make everything really hard for me? Oh my God, I can't believe it. And I'm already running late. And, you know, and there's a whole lot of shooting and everything about what's going on for that other person. They're angry. They might flip them the bird. You know, there's a lot going on. And then if I, uh, <clears throat> I have to get in and do the redo this, um, this little graph, because in reality, I've got Mr. Brown coming back down to a two. But in reality, he might at this point still be either up at a three or down at a 2.5, really. You know, like I've been a little bit generous here. So Mr. Green's almost back down to his baseline pretty much straight away. But then they're still on their way to work and then somebody else might sort of not indicate or something like that. And boom, Mr. Brown's back up at that, that really reactive place. They get to work and someone says, oh, hey, Mr. Green, how are you going? Have you got that, that um, piece of work that's due? Yeah, yeah, I'll get that to you. Or I haven't quite got it done yet, but I'll get that. I hope you have a great day too. And Mr. Brown's like, oh, will you stop hassling me? <laughs> because they're still, they're still elevated. Sorry, I should probably have a mm, annotate. There's my little spotlight. Um, so they're still affected by something that happened at 10 to 8 on the way to work. So when they get to work at 9, they kind of react. So, and then, you know, eventually, you know, it might be lunchtime before they're back down to normal. So when, when you have this sort of sensitive system, it can feel like this secondary reaction is out of out of control, but it's because they've they've stayed up from the previous one. So, you know, this kind of ties in back to that everyone's doing the best they can. So this, you know, Mr. Brown's got a different emotional system to Mr. Green. So even though they might have overreacted towards their colleague it's really the best they can do with what they've got at this time, which is a sensitive system and not really many skills to kind of get things back down to normal. So, you know, this is something to think about in our family systems when, you know, we have someone in the system or some or many in the system who are reactive and seemingly going off on more intensely than is needed um, for the circumstances because we don't realize that we're, they're sort of reacting carrying over you know stress from the previous interaction okay um so what having this highly 
reactive, I've just borrowed this one from a family connection slide and given that this is a NEA PPT <coughs> environment, I hope that's okay. Um, so what happens when you have this very sensitive emotional system and you have an environment that doesn't get it or, or you're not expressing what's going on for you accurately, this can lead to you know, other problems. So one of them can be obviously chaotic relationships, feeling isolated, rejected, you know, people not getting why you've behaved a certain way because they're only looking at what's directly in front of you and there's a whole lot of other stuff that's come behind. Um, it can, intense emotional dysregulation can lead to um, paranoia. It can lead to um, dissociation. You know, I, I think there's a, probably a little bit of a misconception around um, BPD or other sort of emotionally sensitive and reactive and impulsive disorders that it's all externalizing, but there are many people that have, you know, what's also known as like quiet BPD, where um, the tendency is to want to suppress so bad, so that everything gets so suppressed that um, they'll just go numb. So they won't feel anything at all. So, and that can lead to invalidation too, because they, because they could actually be really upset and um, they just, presenting kind of a neutral face um, and of course if you're consistently having interpersonal dysregulation if you're zoning out or if you're reacting out or, or you're thinking that you know everybody hates you or you know these cognitive distortions are going on then you're gonna this is gonna feed into how you see yourself you can have low self-esteem you might have self-loathing you know, what's the point, you know, lack of motivation, all those sorts of things. It can also lead to um, aligning, you know, like uh, with other groups. Now, it's normal for teenagers to try on different identities. It's normal for teenagers to want to be, um, you know, dressing like their friends and sharing the same interests in terms of the music they listen to or the media that they consume. But what you might find with someone who's really got this uh, not a strong sense of self is that they, you know, one week they might be emo, I'm showing my age here, um, and the next week they might be punk, you know, and then they're all in or they're, or they're you know, uh, become a, a vegan campaigner and, you know, in the next week, you know, a month later they might be paleo, you know, it's, um, it's not in the normal realm of, trying on different identities, which is what you would expect of a, an adolescent generally. And then, of course, this emotion dysregulation can also feed into um, the suicidality, the self-harm, the risky behaviours, um, the not caring for themselves, those sorts of things. So it, it's a tough gig, and it's a tough gig for the person with the emotional sensitivity, and it's a, a really, really tough gig for families wanted to acknowledge that okay so what dialectical behavior therapy invites us to do is to move from these sort of polarized positions and go from you know you're the dysregulated one in the family and everybody else is logical and um under control you know that's a sort of a polarized to both and kind of positions so some examples of this might look like you know wanting to say to someone in our family, you know you're not trying you have to make more of an effort now it might be to the person you know if, if we're talking I'm mostly assuming that we're talking about adolescence here but you know with an adolescent it might be you're not trying and you have to make an effort it might be one parent saying this to another parent you know because one of the polarizations that can also happen is that one parent is you know, arguing for um, being softer or more lax. It can depend on your, your interpretation. And the other one, you know, the, the good cop, bad cop routine. So that's something that we want to be aware of as well. Um, so we want to be able to move into this dialectical stance. If you're doing the best you can at this moment with what you've got and 
we want you to do better moving forward. We want you to try harder. Sometimes they can't try any harder than they already are. You know, um, so basically, um, sorry, I keep getting disturbed by the people coming in late. <laughs> um, yeah, so some other ones that we're thinking about, you know, is that I'm right and you're wrong. Now, in our DB teen groups, we call it DB teen. That's just a brand name that we've got for the lifeline groups. But um, in the multifamily groups, I'm noticing that we're getting more kids with um, autism and more kids with um, ADHD as well as, you know, your more classic BPD symptoms. Um, and this one is quite hard with the autistic kids is that they do tend to have that very black and white polarised kind of view of, yeah, but this is just the right way to do it. So um, that can be quite quite challenging as well. But where we do want to get to is like, I feel really strongly about this and I can see that you feel strongly too. Let's see if we can find a middle path. So, so, so being dialectical really invites us to notice when we're being stubborn, notice when we're being willful, notice when we're assuming um, that we've got all the answers to being curious about the other point of view um, and trying to see it from their point of view. So, um, yeah, we, we do a lot of um, exercises where we will ask um, we'll, we'll set up different scenarios and we'll ask the young person to argue the parent's point of view and we'll ask the parent to argue the young person's point of view. And we don't do that <laughs> with, the young, with the actual families. We'll, we'll split that so that we have, um, we'll have the parent, um, we'll pair a parent with another young person so that we can, you know, they can practice that in a, in a non, um, not as challenging point of view. So other examples of being dialectical is that you can be gentle and strong, um, that you can share some things with others and also keep some, some things private. Again, noticing with young people with um, BPD traits um, that they will often either say nothing at all or they'll make a new friend and they will spill everything. They'll, they'll, they'll tell everything. They'll, they'll disclose everything and then that person might go, whoa, that's too much for me and back away or they'll find that that friend is not, um, not trustworthy and then they will have lost intimacy and trust and, you know, then it becomes a negative feeling for them. So, again, it's this kind of um, trying to break these all or nothing stances. I mean, I think I talk to a lot of parents, you know, and, you know, when we're talking about this, the struggles that their kids have, you know, say, so do you find that they they go into relationships at 100 miles an hour and then they're out just as fast? And, you know, more often than not, they'll say yes. So, um, so this is, these are the sort of awarenesses that we try to try to develop with them. So how do we become more dialectical? We notice, we are mindful of when we're using words like always, you never, you make me feel like when we put the power in, on the other person. So um, we also, I don't have this one here, but we also um, try and be mindful of should. I should have done this. I should have done that. Well, you know, um, even, even just changing the word to could you know, opens up the possibilities of there isn't just one way to do things. You know, this non-dialectical non stance is when you think that there is only one way to do things. So, um, yeah, noticing, you know, when you're arguing with someone and you say, you always lie to me. You never tell me the truth. You know, why should I, I just, you know, I just feel like you're such a liar. And it might be that we're saying these things or it might be that we're on the receiving end of them. And if we're on the receiving end of these kinds of statements, 
again, the invitation in being dialectical is that you'd be mindful of receiving that and going and noticing the natural response to be defensive around that. You know, it, it, it's, you know, if someone accuses us, well, I'm, I'm a reactive person. You know, I, I'm quite sensitive and I'm quite reactive. I have a very quick return to baseline because I've got DBT in my life. But, you know, I, I will notice that if someone accuses me of something, you know, my system, really? <laughs> and I'm ready. I'm ready to defend myself. And you've just got to notice that and then go, okay, uh, what's the kernel of truth in this? What am I missing? Why would they think that? Um, you know, how can I deal with this in a, in, a, in a dialectical way? So one way might be something like, look, you haven't always been honest with me and that makes it hard for me to trust you this time. You know, it's, it's, it's moving from always to sometimes. Um, we want to, another way that we can try to be dialectical is we can look at, thing, other thing, at things from the other point of view. So, for example, if there's a, a dispute happening around um, a, a curfew, you know, and the young person's going, oh, look, there's this party and it's, it's not really going to start until 10 o'clock and so I really want to be able to stay until 2. And, uh, you know, mum's like, no, 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 <laughs> your curfew is 10 o'clock and you need to come home. You know, being able to step in and say, you know, well, why would she want to stay out until 2 o'clock, you know, and I mean, like we've all been young people, right? And she wants to appear cool. She wants doesn't want to. She wants to feel doesn't want to feel like she's going to miss out. My invitation is to think now: Why would that be useful? Why would that be useful to step into their point of view? It's so that we can let them know that we understand. You know, like we we really want to be able to get into. You know, I get. I get that you want to hang with your friends. I get that, you know, you, you've got some friends that are older and that they're allowed to do that sort of stuff. I understand. And I need you home because it's a school night and you're going to come home. And, and we also want the young people to sort of think, well, why does mum want me to be home at 10 p.m.? Now, being dialectical doesn't mean that we arrive at midnight as the time to come home. Being dialectical means that we would sort of go, step into their shoes and go, okay, I get that you want to stay out until two o'clock. Now say it's a Friday night and they're 17 and a half. Um, you know, what you might sort of say to them, look, I don't know these people. I don't, I, I'm worried that there's going to be alcohol there. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, concerned about these sorts of things. What do you think is the solution here? So you're inviting the other person to come up with, with some solutions. Um, and so a middle path might be, look, I want you to text me at 11 o'clock or I want to talk to you on the phone at 11 o'clock and find out how things are going. And if you don't come, if you don't, if you don't answer my text or if you don't send me a text at 11, I'm driving to the party and I'm going to come and pick you up. And a dialectical stance might be, you know, we'll have a chat at 11, we'll talk about how it's going, do you feel safe, you know, what's going on, or it could be, you know, I'm going to speak to the parents. But the point is, is that we're trying to, um, we're trying to, we're trying to sort of hear each other's side. Now, if it's a Thursday night and there's an important test the next day, that might just be a blanket no. So di being dialectical is not being... It's not, you know, the, even though we say middle path, it's not going for right smack down the middle. It's around looking for the kernel of truth in the other situation and um, in the other's point of view and getting and seeing if they can do that for us too. And the other one, this is, you know, great relationships one-on-one, -on -one, always saying I statements instead of you statements is another way to sort of try and get to that point of view. So um, here's our little pop quiz moment. So bearing that in mind, um, which of these statements do you think is the more dialectical one and pop the answer in the chat? Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Awesome. Yeah, well done. Great. Yeah, and you can see why it is, you know. And it's really hard for me and I've got to keep trying. So this... You know, all of the, the other thing about these, you've obviously all got it, but, you know, like I'll use, um, yeah. So basically, for example, um, thanks, guys, you, you're right. The answer is C. Um, this being non-dialectical or being black and white thinking is, you know, obviously a, a, quite often a really common problem for people with emotional sensitivity and it can manifest in kind of not just in the um the big drama ways it can also be like you know um you, you might have someone who's academically doing really well they're used to getting a's and they do a test and don't do well and all of a sudden it's i'm so stupid i'm such an idiot you know, why did I think I was any good at this? I mean, I'm just going to give up on uni and everything. You know, that, that, that full-on um, extreme position. That's, that's, that's sort of an example of being non-dialectical. So an example of being dialectical around that would be, you know, I can fail a test and I can still be capable of doing this subject. That makes sense. Sorry, my mouse is doing weird things. Okay. So the second one, this is pretty obvious, I think. I know I'm right about this. You're totally wrong about that, and I'm right. Has anyone had that argument? I imagine you have. Um, and then uh, thinking about what the dialectical statement is, I can understand why you feel this way, and I feel differently about it. Okay. Um, So, sorry, I keep thinking that I'm going to be able to curse on my way through, but I can't, I have to make the point. Okay, so let's think about some dialectical dilemmas. These are, again, this is something that was specifically um, built up for, um, for the thinking about families of where, where a young person in the family has problems with emotional dysregulation. So too loose might look like there's no standard meal time, there's uh, no requirements regarding getting to school or other behaviour, there's kids' stuff piled up all over the house, the kids don't have any responsibilities, um, kids go out with no curfew and parents don't know where they are, little or no supervision. Um, and for a teenager, it might be like for them being responsible for themselves, it might be that they don't have a bedtime, that they're texting nightly until well into the early hours they're eating what they want when they want um, they might be spending their money the minute they get it they might be you know putting off school assignments until the last minute or not doing them at all um and i want to emphasize oh sorry that's just gone and done its own thing there um don't know how to get it back um and the two strict example for parents might be permanently removing tv the internet phone or they might not be allowed kids to go out and socialize at all um, they might be overusing punishment they might have perfect perfectionistic standards regarding um, how the, school, the teenager does in school sports other activities they might not give them any privacy and so on and an example of a, um, examples of a teenager being too strict with themselves might be that they you know um, they may just study excessively. They may not do any sport. They may not do any socialising. You know, it could be their choice to be like that, you know, and that sort of, oh, my God, I, I failed that test. So that's it. I'm cancelling all my, all my events on the weekend. I'm, you know, uh, not going to do that. They may, they, may, they may diet to the point of deprivation. They may have overly perfectionistic 
um, standards regarding school, sports, appearance or other activities. Um, and the problem with being overly strict on oneself is that it's impossible to ever feel good about what you're doing because you, it's impossible to meet these standards. So, and this is a common problem with, with young people on themselves as well. So, so we want to find a middle path between being too loose and too strict. So, you know, we can basically, from a parenting point of view, that would be having clear rules, enforcing them consistently and being willing to negotiate on some issues and not overusing consequences. So, um, you know, basically, so, you know, imagine that there's an example of this might be, there's a 15 year old girl, she wants to get body piercings, she wants to stay up past midnight, video chatting with friends, she wants to sleep at her boyfriend's house, and the parent might be insisting no boyfriend, body piercings, anything like that until she turns 18 and she's got to be in bed by 10. Um, a middle path on that one might be um, that the parent becomes willing to negotiate on some issues while not bending on others. So sleeping over at the boyfriend's house is off the table, but um, being able to spend time with the boyfriend during the day is okay. Um, she might be, you know, she could earn the privilege of um, staying up until 11 o'clock and chatting online with friends. You know, if she's been able to do her homework, she's abided by her weekend curfew and so on. But maybe this parent will say that body piercings are non-negotiable beyond earrings. You know, like, there's no right or wrong answer on these things. It is down to the family. It is down to the team, you know, um, and so on. So that's kind of what we're talking about, about around, you know, this finding this middle path. Um, so just have a think. Um, again, this is just an introduction to these skills. But when we do, when we're teaching this in the, um, in the groups, we will actually talk about this, then we'll get um, the young people and the parents will actually make us a line in the group and we'll ask the parents to put themselves where they think they are and we'll ask the young people to stand where they think the parent is. And sometimes they're right next to each other and sometimes they're like this and they're looking at each other going, what? <laughs> you know, but it, it opens up a really nice um, opportunity for a conversation around what do we think is going on in this family, you know, um, and uh, so on. So and the, next, the next sort of area that we look at is, you know, sometimes we can make light of problems or we can make too much of problems. So in the example of a teenager, you know, they might, um, I mean, there's, there's a whole handout that we give out on what's typical uh, teenage behaviour and what's cause for concern. And, you know, sometimes um, we'll have families where they're getting really, really crazily worried about kind of typical teenage behaviour. And then on the other hand, we'll have people really acting out and, 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 the, and the parents might, you know, just not really see it as, as, as an area of concern. So, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's a delicate balance to kind of work out. Um, but, okay, so, so for, for example, um, an example of a parent making too much of typical behaviours might be something like um, a teenager's texting three or four friends every day wants to sleep over at her friend's houses every couple of weeks and likes to spend an hour or two alone in her room each night. Um, you know, if a parent tries to put a stop to these behaviours, saying you're too focused on your friends and you should spend more time with family. Um, basically, you know, the middle path for that might be, you know, I mean, that would be a case of, I think, being overly concerned 
you know, teenagers do want to spend some time alone in their room, but spending all day, every day alone in their room is definitely cause for concern. Um, sometimes, you know, like it can be if the teenager is making an issue, is not making enough attention to their behaviour, it might be, you know, Um, a problem. So, for example, sorry, I'm just trying to find the example that I was looking for there. Um, there might be a teenager who downplays the fact that she's spending up to eight hours a day on the computer, regularly meets people online and discloses too much information, lies to her parents, sneaks off to parties, and just says, oh, everyone my age does this stuff. All my friends are doing it. We've all heard that one, right? Um, and she might you know, one night take more of her prescribed pills than she's supposed to, comes home drunk, blacks out. And then she'd tell her therapist, it's no big deal, I was just a little tired. Now that's a that's a classic case of making light of problems at the extreme end. So um, a middle path for that teenager might be saying, I love my computer time and I even meet some nice people online who understand me and go through similar things. And I like to have a drink sometimes at a party, but lately I feel like it's all getting out of control to the extreme. I feel like I could use some help managing the computer stuff, the pills and the drinking before something really bad happens. So, you know, and it can be a while before you get to the point where a young person actually can do that. So it's important to be able to recognize when this behavior crosses the line and get help for that behavior and try and recognize which behaviors are just typical of adolescent development. The other one of forcing, the other dilemma that often impacts on families is this question around forcing independence and fostering dependence. When we talk about validation, which is coming up, um, it can actually be really invalidating to always go out and solve your teen's problems. You might feel like you're being a great parent going into bat for them, but what you're actually teaching them is you can't do it for yourself. So um, an example of this might be, uh, let's say there's a young person who is quite anxious and um, she goes to a school across town and the parent that normally drives her to school because she's too anxious to take public transport has got a new job. And is going to be starting this new job in a few weeks' time, which means that, um, and let's say this, this teenager is 15, so definitely old enough to be taking pu um, public transport on our own. Um, so on the one extreme, we've got this fostering of dependence where the parent always drove them across town, took two hours out of their day, well, actually four by the time they had to drive across and pick them up and bring them back again, and all that stress of driving through traffic and all of that. That's at one extreme of the fostering dependence. What can happen when we get stuck on these dialectical dilemmas is that she can just go, I'm done with this. I'm done with, I can't do four hours a day anymore. I've got a new job, you know, and they're going, you're just going to have to catch the train on your own. That would be forcing independence, right? This kid's never, never caught the train on their own. They don't, you know, they, <laughs> it's just a meltdown. How am I going to do that? The middle path in this might be something like for the next week, I'm going to catch the train with you. We're going to take public transport together because I'm not going to start my new job for a while. And then, you know, a couple of days later, you know, might be the first three days they travel together on the train. Uh, the next two days, mum's in the other carriage. You know, the next week it might be mum just goes a few stations along, gets off, you know, um, and, you know, there's a middle path that can be found. That's that. So, again, just looking at these ones, imagine, and, you know, imagine that you could do this with, with your young person. Think about where do you think you might fit on, on these along these lines you know are you at the making light of problems and are you more at the making too much of problems are you have you got a happy medium there you know are you 
fostering dependence you know you're doing everything for, for your young person and they will be often they'll be asking you to do that <laughs> you know they'll they'll be saying but I can't but I can't or are you you know forcing independence or do you find yourself flipping from one to the other under the extreme stresses that come with you know having someone in your family that's really dysregulated um you know and that's like hey that happens a lot don't please don't beat yourself up that's not what this is about so we want to be able to give adolescents guidance support and coaching to help figure out how to be responsible and slowly give them more freedom and independence while continuing to encourage an appropriate amount of reliance on others I think at this point it's worthwhile saying that um, it is uh, it, it's worth bearing in mind that becoming skillful for a young person with fears of abandonment. I mean, I think the you know the the one thing that defines borderline personality disorder or EUPD from other kinds of disorders is the fear of abandonment. So becoming skillful and being told that they're doing so well or you can do this for yourself, I'm really proud of what you're doing, can actually be quite a triggering statement because it triggers those feelings of abandonment. So we want to be really in, um, dialectical in how we uh, encourage people, the young person, to become more independent, which is, oh, wow, I can, I can see you know, you've done really well and I can see how hard that was for you and I can see how hard you're trying and I know that, you know, that this is hard for you and it can be worrying that, we'll, but I'm going to be with you, not doing things for you, but I'm, you know, going to be with you all the way, that, 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 you, that becoming more skillful is not going to mean that you're going to be abandoned. Um, okay. So one of the great advantages of being dialectical is that it really helps us with validation. I think we said in the um, in the uh, blurb for this that this is be really good for people that have already done family connections because we don't do the middle path skills so much in family connections, but we do do a lot on validation. So this is the one slide that you're going to get on it. But if you are stepping into somebody else's point of view, which is what we're asking people to do with that dialectical stance then when it's much much easier to validate right if we can go what's going on for this person why are they why are they sort of taking this extreme position what's what is the kernel of truth in this extreme position that I can validate so how do we validate we pay attention we give people our full attention you know the um I think this is possibly around the fear of abandonment but it seems to me that a lot of stresses can happen when someone's trying to get out the door you know and that desire to go look I'm, I'm I've got I'm busy right now I've got to go you know just stop stop turn around give that person your full attention because actually even though it feels like you're you know you're losing time because you're not getting your bag ready to go or whatever you'll actually save more time because you're actually giving that person your full attention um, reflect back what's what's being said. So um, this is really important with a with a, with a cohort where um, the technical term for it is is that they're not very good at accurate expression. So because um, there's a lot of secondary stuff that goes on, if you think back to that diagram of Mr. Brown, um, they may be presenting something and when you reflect it back to them, they'll go, no, that's not what I mean, even though it's what you heard, but it helps them to hear what they've said and then you're more, much more likely to actually get to what they're really feeling or really trying to communicate. And sometimes if they have said something that is really invalidating of you, you know, if you reflect it back, I'm sorry, you, you feel like I lie to you all the time? gives them a chance to go well not all the time <laughs> you know but or yeah I do okay wow well I can see that if you think I lie to you all the time it's going to be really hard for you to trust me that's validating it doesn't say that yes I agree I lie all the time it's just like yeah if that's how you see me then yeah that's going to be hard for you to trust um 
the next level of validation is we read minds. We're, we're sensitive to what is not being said. So, you know, it's the old female, fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Someone's got crossed arms, hold, you know, a set jaw, then probably we want to read some minds there and go, nope, we're not fine. So, um, you know, so you might, you know, Belinda might say to me, well, Jen, you say you're fine, but I notice that you've got your, your arms are crossed and your shoulders are kind of tight. So um, I'm wondering what else might be going on for you there. And nothing, <laughs> you might choose to back away in that moment. You know, like, I think uh, there's so much intensity in uh, some of our interactions that, that we can take that intensity and think that we must solve everything now, now, now. Sometimes we don't need to solve everything now, now, now. Sometimes we need to step away. Okay. Um, understand. Try and understand what's going on for them and, and how it might make sense based on their experiences, situation, state of mind or physical condition. So, um, you know, if someone's been, if you're dealing with school refusal, and someone's been bullied at school and they're trying to go to a new school and we really want to support them in going to a new school, we can validate how very hard it is for that person on that first day. I get it. It makes sense that if you've had a really negative experience in your old school, that your new school is going to be pretty anxiety provoking. And because we're dialectical, we're going to say, and I think it's worth giving it a shot. Um, note the valid I think I just gave an example of that so look for what the other person is thinking feeling or doing being valid um, and show a quality you know like we're not we're not jumping in and solving all the problems we're not we're not looking down on them we're not looking up to them we're just trying to you know we're all humans in the same suit trying to trying to make things work okay so, sorry, this is a lot of talking, I know. Um, what I'm trying in this introduction to um, middle path skills, this is something that we would do over several weeks with examples and exercises and things like that. So thanks for sticking with us. Um, the other thing that we do is we look at the behavioral change strategies. And if we are trying to change our own behavior, so we might want to get up every morning and go for a walk because we need, we need to actually get some self-care into our lives um, if we want to uh, change somebody else's behavior you know um, and that can be to you know improve the behavior or decrease the behavior so whether it's for ourselves or whether it's for someone else we really want to focus on doing a lot of reward and reinforcement when we get it right, when we do the behaviour, any step towards the behaviour that we want to um, achieve. Of the behaviours that we don't want, we want to ignore them if it's safe to do so. Obviously, we don't ignore um, life-threatening or um, other threatening behaviours. And we want to use punishment as a last resort. Okay. So just think about that as an as you know the inverted triangle of what really works. Reward and reinforcement works a whole lot more than um, ignoring, extinguishing. It works, and punishment's not as effective as a lot of us would, you know, were sort of socialized to believe. So, what do we? How do we do? How do we increase desirable behaviors? We reward and or reinforce every single step towards the desired behavior. So imagine that um, you've got a young person in, their, in your life and they love baking on the weekends. It's something that you do want to encourage because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's what we would call an accumulating positive experiences thing. It's something that fills their well, you know, gets them ready for school because they've done something fun. And it's their job to clean up the kitchen afterwards, but they don't. You come in and it's always an absolute mess. So it might be tempting to, you know, nag and carry on and that may or may not work, but if let's assume it's not working. Or, you know, finally they've 
done the cooking and they have actually washed the dishes. I haven't wiped down any of the benches. You know, what do we do in that situation? If they've never cleaned up properly after themselves and this is the first time they've done the dishes, then we actually praise, oh, you got the dishes done. That's amazing. Thank you. And I, I think for a lot of people it's like, but they didn't do the whole job. You know, like our own perfectionism can kick in at this point. You know, um, why would they clean up, you know, even make those first steps towards cleaning up the whole lot if, if the first thing that they get is not good enough? You know, so we really want to be able to go, that's great, you got there. I, I come from a family of perfectionists, so my temptation is then to go, oh, and here, let me help you clean up the, I'll wipe the benches down with you. Now, that might be enough. That might be good. It might be good. But it could also be, um, you know, it's, it's sort of the negative there. I, nobody ever notices when I, you know, get even something done. So we really want to really notice and reinforce every step towards the behaviour. We want to reinforce immediately. Imagine if you're, um, you know, learning how to, you're playing tennis and you're practicing your forehand, your backhand, whatever. And your coach is watching you and they go, that 14th stroke that you did, that was perfect. And you've done 50 strokes. <laughs> like, it doesn't work, does it? We want to know immediately that we've done the right thing. Um, reinforce appropriately. So the reinforcements or rewards has to be motivating to the person, not, not what's motivating to you, not what you think they should get. So if you're a teenager, it might be something like you get more screen time as a reward. You know, you want to talk to the, the young person about what's, you know, more rewarding for them. It, um, it might be, you know, that they get to go on a trip or something. You know, like it, it, it's, it's got to be what works for them. It's a little bit like when you think about with dog training, you know, like there are dogs that want are rewarded by play. There are dogs that are rewarded by by food, you know, if you try to reward a dog that's motivated by play with food, it's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, knowing your young person and what's reinforcing for them is really important. Um, reinforcement can be positive or negative. This is kind of confusing, but basically, um, you know, a positive reinforcement for at least getting the dishes done is, oh, that's great. Thanks so much, you know, for, for getting started on cleaning up. That's great. Uh, a negative example of a negative reinforcement would be stopping nagging. That when I get the job done, if mum keeps nagging me to clean up my room and I clean up my room, the nagging stops. Awesome. You know, that, that and, and, you know, another sort of negative reinforcement would be, you know, if I have a headache and I take a, pan, a Panadol, then the Panadol takes away my pain. So therefore, the next time I have a headache, I'll go and take a Panadol. So, um, yeah, uh, we want to, it's really simple. We just keep it short, sweet, and we don't follow up with a correction and criticism. This is, this is my challenge in life. <laughs> um, okay. So how do we stop behaviours that we don't want to see? Uh, extinction. This is, this is um, when we... We ignore behaviours that we don't want to see. Now, obviously, we don't do this with unsafe behaviours. We don't do this, um, you know, where we're, where we're worried that the person could come to harm or other people could come to harm. But a simple example of this would be take your mind back to school and you have actually someone sitting next to you and they are constantly wanting to talk and chat and you know you are um you want to focus because it's a subject you really like and you want to do well on the exam and this person keeps talking and you keep getting in trouble with the, the teacher because you keep answering them if we want that behavior to stop then we will steadfastly maintain our eyes forward and just not engage with the person trying to interrupt us at all now what do you reckon is going to happen when we first do that we're going to get a behaviour burst. They're going, to, they're going to annoy us more. They're going to try harder, right? I mean, we've, I'm sure we've all sat next to that person. 
So we have to write it out. So it might be, you know, uh, that your young person gets abusive on the phone and it's like, you know what, if they're safe, it's like, okay, you know, you, I, I don't want to be spoken to like this on the phone. So when you start raising your voice like that, I'm going to hang up. And the, you're going to get 15 calls back, right? And you've got to write it out. So, so as you're trying to change behaviours, be ready for the behaviour burst, the spike in behaviour to make sure that you really mean it. <laughs> That's the test. Do you really mean this? I mean, um, take it back to toddlers in supermarkets. I want the sweet. You know, and they throw a tantrum and you're just so embarrassed. You're like, yep, I'll buy the, the treat. You have reinforced that throwing a tantrum around the lolly pile gets them a lolly. So, so you, no, you're not going to do this anymore. You decide not to do that. You go past the lolly aisle and, of course, the kid goes off and, and you say no and they go off and they go off and they go off and you just hold your line and, you know, um, because you're expecting it to escalate because it's worked in the past. The one thing we don't want to do is five, four times out of five, we write it out in this period when we're trying to change things. And then we go, oh, God, today's not the day. Today, the supermarket's busy. Everybody's looking at me. I can't handle it. It won't hurt to just buy the lollies this time. That's what's called intermittent reinforcement. And that is stronger. The one time that you give in is stronger than the four times that you didn't. So, I mean, I'm using really simplistic examples, but, you know, in complex cases, and if, if you've got access to a therapist and that, this is something that you would talk about them with, in complex cases, there may be ways that we are inadvertently rewarding extreme behaviour because it's been effective. Um, so, yeah, this is something to, to sort of think on. We've when we are ignoring, we're not punishing. Yeah. Sorry, I heard. Oh, sorry, Jenny. That was just me saying we just got a couple of questions come up. How do you, would you feel that you could answer a couple? Yeah, um, a couple of slides off finishing. So, okay, wonderful. All right, we'll keep them to the end. Yeah. Um, so, when we're doing this, we want to be neutral. And then if the desired behavior occurs, we want to be warm and reinforcing. This is harder than you'd think because, you know, obviously sometimes the resentment builds up when things are really hard, right? So being able to go, awesome, you, you know, you got that there. Like holding on to old wounds and being resentful around them and, well, they should have done the right thing. There's no, there's no reinforcer of making changes and making changes are really hard. So, you know, we've got to be ready to be warm and encouraging. Um, and we want to let them know that this is the, the strategy that we're trying to use, that we are really trying to um, change the behaviour. That means, you know, if you start yelling and abusing me on the phone, I'm going to hang up. I don't, want, I don't want this anymore. It's really stressful for me. It's not effective for us in, in our communication. Okay. Now, punishment. Punishment's the last resort because you can overdo it, especially if you're in emotion mind, what we call emotion mind in DBT, which is, you know, like you're in a big, right, that's it. I'm taking your phone off for a week or you're grounded for a month. And then that means, or you can't drive your car, I'm taking your car keys away. And then you've got to drive them everywhere for a month. You know, that might not be the way to, <laughs> the most effective way to do it. Um, if there's no rewards for the behaviours that we want to see and we're only punishing the behaviours that we don't want to see, then people just get secretive about it. They get sneaky. Um, it can be demoralising. And it can lead to increased hopelessness, depression, and anger. It doesn't teach the new behavior and it's not motivating. And it may lead to self punishment, especially with those perfectionistic, high um, achieving kind of young people. But so we do need to use it sometimes. Um, it, it is a last resort and we don't want to do it in the heat of the moment. We want to keep reinforcing the desired behavior. So we know, you know, it's all about, you know, acknowledging that there are maladaptive um, coping strategies and 
putting adaptive coping strategies in their place. So we really want to, we really want to support them in making those changes. Uh, it means having clear rules and expectations. It means being prepared in advance for what's an appropriate punishment, you know, for, for certain behaviours. So um, I think a very common issue is young people refusing to give up their phones in the evening, wanting to stay online until one, two o'clock in the morning, something ridiculous. So, you know, you don't want to have that discussion about what's going to happen, you know, in the heat of that, trying to get the phone off the young person. Um, and we, we're always, always, always going back to the top of that inverted triangle. We're always thinking about how do we reinforce what we do want to have happen. Like consequences are immediate and we also allow natural consequences. So we're not, we're not sort of going in and, and, and solving problems for people either. Okay, so just reminding you again that that's the reward reinforcement is where we really want most of our attention to be. Um, ignoring what we don't want to be happening. So, you know, that sort of negative behaviour of getting rewarded, even if it's rewarded with yelling and shouting and all of those things, and, and that our punishment's smaller and more appropriate. There's some resources. And, yeah, we can go for uh, questions. I can have a look at what's in the chat. Um, okay. Um, okay. So we, do we have the Q&A option in here, Belinda, or do we want to? We can, yeah, we can have questions if people would like to Put throw them in the chat. We, we won't be able to answer them all, unfortunately, but we will try and answer as many as we can. If you need to stay anonymous, feel, please feel free to send me a direct message and I can ask you a question anonymously. Yep. Um, uh, yep. PowerPoints, it, the whole webinar is recorded. So you we will provide a link to this webinar um yeah. to all the registrants and that will be available on our youtube channel next week ish yep um and um if you um oops sorry um we can, I, i'm quite happy to print these off and um office? yeah sure yeah if people want a pdf <laughs> of it mm -hmm. um I mean, the thing else, you know, there's some of the questions here. Um, this is, it really is about being dialectical on these things that, you know, um, there are no, it's not a hard and fast rule. So, you know, sort of, <laughs> and it's, it's a, um, I think you need to be dialectical with yourself too, which is that you're going to try this stuff and sometimes you're going to get it right and sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And, um you know, determining, you know, what is behaviour that you can ignore and what is behaviour that uh, that you need to attend to is uh, difficult and it's going to depend on their skill level and so, and so on. It's quite hard. Please give an example of pairing negative consequences with reinforcers of desired behaviour. Damn. <laughs> so we're right for putting it up there, right? Um, let me think. Uh, See if I can find a nice, a nice handy example on that one. Um, so I think, yeah, reinforcers have got to be. It's got to be um, the negative one that we find a punishment. Just while Jenny's finding a couple of things, I see a um, couple of questions coming up about um, BPD with comorbid other mental health conditions. And there's probably more specialists in this area. I mean, I don't know what Jenny's uh, specialty is in working with people with both BPD and autism. Um, 
but at least from any ABPD at the moment, it's not an area that we've been able to provide much research or support in. We are providing most of our programs really in the DBT skills, particularly for people that are in relationship with someone with BPD. Um, and I think there's more and more research happening out there that's showing that, that there can be a link and, and people are presenting with more than one mental health condition at the one time. Um, and there might be some further information on Origin. Origin, if you don't know, are a youth, um, young people specific mental health service here in Victoria. For, so for any Victorians, and they have a lot of information of, of some comorbid um, conditions with BPD. Do you have anything further on that, Jenny? Um, no, uh, I was thinking about uh, the combining with the with the, the punishment with a reinforcer so that's okay um, it might be something like um around phone use so you know if they are able to um yeah so say you say you might have decided that they're going to lose access to the phone and i've heard different solutions around people having apps that turn turn phones off automatically and things like that. It might be that you, uh, you know, if you comply, then four nights a week, then you can have 30 minutes more on the weekend, but you have to earn that privilege. Um, so, you know, it, it could be that, in, you know, complying with the punishment gets the reward you know, you get the phone back sooner if you're able to, you know, comply with, with what's being asked. Um, that, that's possibly the best one done. So um, asking about is DBT, pro I don't do DBT programs for young people that different? No. So the four main units of DBT for adults is mindfulness, distress tolerance, um, emotional regulation and uh, interpersonal effectiveness skills. The DBT for young people um, has those four units plus uh, the middle part skills. So this is a greater emphasis on um, validation, the trying to get to that more dialectical thinking, the looking at what is typical, uh, well, everything that we just went through that that blast through is that sort of major difference. So the major difference is having the parents in the room, learning the skills alongside and taking that dialectical stance of equality, you know, going, yes, the parents need to know this as much as the young people do. Um, and, um, yeah, that, that sort of that thing around, you know, responsibility, you know, that, that, that dance of a young person getting older and, you know, should, being able to take on more responsibility, but perhaps not having the, the emotional resources to be able to do that. Um, um, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to look through and, and, and find questions that we've got um so just about the the adolescence and adult child i'm not sure about the age group i would love to run groups for you know adult children and and parents together uh i don't know of any um our dbt program is just for 14 to 18 year olds um i know that in perth there are some clinicians that want to set up groups for younger people um personally i'd love to set up a group for 18 to 21 year olds and their parents because you know just because the law says you're an adult at 18 doesn't mean that you are especially when someone's got you know problems with emotional dysregulation um but you know they're not there um trevor's asking about dialectical yes it does mean that the other person needs to be validated and certainly you know as i said before there's no hard rules around this stuff you know what works for one family doesn't work for another. So 
we'll have groups sometimes where there are young people where alcohol and other drug use is a real issue and you know like we when we use a, uh, an example of going out to parties you know that example really resonates and then we'll have another group where the cohort are really really um, introverted and their problem is they don't go out at all and they certainly don't use alcohol or other drugs and so we have to use a different example you know it's trying to find what's relevant and unfortunately you know um we can only give very general examples here um no uh as far as the parents yes they do every group with the children so in our in our program um it's a 12-week program and the adults come to every group they have to do the homework just like the kids do um, and they participate in the, you know, they participate as equals. And um, if a young person can't make the group, then the adult can't come on their own. So they have to come together. Um, no DBTs for anyone it can be for anyone of any age. Um, uh -huh. Um, I've got a question here. How do we deal with the teenage? I hate you so much, Vitriol, and it's all your fault with the then wanting you to be with her at night and chat and rub her feet. Yeah, that's a classic example of needing to be dialectical, that your young person can both hate you in the moment and still desperately need you. Um, and um, I think that's just a kind of a place of acceptance. Uh, one thing I didn't mention when I was doing the validation slide was that it's really important um, that we validate ourselves and um, you know one thing I think that's really hard for people is um, you know they'll learn about validation and they'll go yeah but I'm invalidated <laughs> all day every day um, and you know the reality is is that they're just not often if they're not engaged in a program themselves you know, like if you're doing family connections for example which is parent parents partners friends children of someone with VPD um, then you might be learning these skills and they might not be participating in any kind of program. And that can be really, really tough. Um, so it's important that you, that you get adept at validating yourself. So even when, you know, you lose it at, at, at your loved one um, and you think, oh, that wasn't skillful, you know, just validate you're doing the best you can and you can do better, you know, like and validate that it's hard and, you know, look, you know, have I had enough sleep? Have I, you know, been putting my oxygen mask on? Those sorts of things. Um, so I think it's an acceptance that 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 sort of key dialectic that we ask for of acceptance of accepting that this young person is someone who can both hate and love you at the same time and not want you and need you at the same time, and that that's hard. Um, uh, around diagnoses, yes. Uh, Anita asked, how did Marsha grow into what she became? I admire her. I highly recommend her um, memoir, which is called Building a Life Worth Living, where she talks about um, her experiences with mental illness. So she was um, in 1961 or something when she was 18. She was hospitalised for two years and was discharged uh, without having had anything resolved, mostly because I just really couldn't do anything for her. Um, and, um, yeah, she kind of made a vow to herself that she would do everything she could to, that once she got out of hell, she was going to find out how to help people get out of hell and go back and do that herself. Um, so it's great. I, I've I'm a geek, so, you know, her talking about how she came to develop the skills and everything hits all my buttons, but it might not hit everybody's, but I found it very inspiring. She didn't disclose that she had experiences of mental illness herself until, she, until 2010 or 2011. So that was quite a big, big day. Um, someone's asking about autism. Um, yeah, look, um, it's something I need to do more research in. It's just something that I've noticed in our groups that we have. Um, so 
with the DBT program, it's it's not a diagnosis based program. It's not what diagnosis do you have? Do you come in? It's a, are you struggling with emotional and behavioural dysregulation, and that might manifest as suicidality or whatever, you know. And um, we we you know the main assessment we do is 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 this person safe to have in a group, and um, are they capable of learning in a group, and um, if so then um, they come in. So kids with um, autism will have emotional outbursts and they'll have behavioural outbursts and um, the, the source of it will be quite different, I think. I think that's the main thing, but um, sort of learning about emotions and um, uh, being able to... Um, you know, recognise the emotions, recognise the triggers, use the distress tolerance skills in order to come back down. That works. That works whether you have autism or BPD. There are programs. I know that um, I can't point you to the resources, but I do, I've got a vague recollection of the programs being developed specifically for DBT for ASD, for autism spectrum disorder, but I, I can't... Um, I can't, I can't direct you to it because I... We can send some further links and resources out yeah. to all of our participants um, yeah. in the days following. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amanda, for, for clarifying that. That's really great. Um, oh, any other... I, I think we've got four more minutes um so yeah, yeah i'll just, just I'll, one more question. sorry i just lost you then belinda yeah you are you you're not muted but i can't hear you can anyone else hear, can everyone yeah else no hear there you are you're back oh i'm back <laughs> great sorry what were you saying oh. oh i just said maybe just time for one more question well, no, I think it's time for reminding people about the program. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, yes. Uh, so, yes, so some of you um, have probably completed our Family Connections programs. If not, we highly encourage you to apply. Our, the Family Connections program is, is specific for families and carers of a person with BPD and your your person doesn't attend with you it's specifically for you to learn some relational skills based on dbt and dbt skills um, as developed by marsha linehan to enhance and improve your relationships and the family dynamics um I, and yeah i I'd, I'd just love to say thank you very much to jenny for this wonderfully <clears throat> informative and supportive presentation tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you to our audience for listening and participating. Thank you to, uh, to so much to all of you who have already donated. Our organisation relies solely on donations and as yet we have no government funding, although this is something we are working on as much as possible. And we'd like to ask if you have found this webinar helpful, we'd love you to consider a donation to help support our work. I'll put a link in the chat in just a minute. All the funds raised help us to train more passionate volunteer leaders, all of our Family Connections leaders, including Jenny, our volunteers, uh, to run more of our Family Connections programs, which teach more Australian families the skills they need to have better relationships with their loved ones who have BPD. So I'll just pop the link here to donate. Thank you very much, everybody. And yes, highly encourage you to register for, for a program. We do do some face-to-face -face in various, um, at various times. We do a lot online too at the moment, like with everything. <laughs> and, and the other thing about doing Family Connections is, um, you know, it resources you. There was a fantastic, um, on this topic, uh, there was a, 
another presentation just last week from Sash Bear, which is the Canadian organisation that I've linked to. And, um, you know, I think I went, oh, how do I follow this woman? I thought, I'll just do what I do and you'll have two different versions of the same kind of information. Um, so there's a really great um, presentation on the Sash Bear website as well by now, I should think. And, um, you know, you can't force someone to go to therapy. Um, so, you know, in my experience with um, uh, family connections is that when family members do family connections, they become more skillful, their interactions with their person change, and you are actually modelling to your young person that therapy can make a difference. And um, often, you know, people will start seeking help um, as a result. I mean, it's a byproduct. It shouldn't be your main reason for coming to do family connections. You should be doing family connections to resource yourself because, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say about that Sash Bear um, presentation. She was saying in this presentation that families have higher rates of PTSD than first responders. You know, like you guys are, you guys are the true front line and, you know, it's really, really effing tough and, you um, so you deserve to get resourced. And, you know, that's what Family Connections does. And it makes me so angry <laughs> that we don't have government funding for this program yet. You know, it's crazy. Um, obviously, we don't know the Governor General. Um, but anyone got an introduction? <laughs> if you have any kind of connection to any kind of politician, yes. write to send them. It through now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, send it through, send it through. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up. Um, but, yeah, basically... If you, if you do the work to resource yourself and it will at least help you deal with your situation better and um, you will be modelling that you can change. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's any stats out there, but my um, anecdotal experience is that when family members get help and change the way that they interact, the other person, the young person's quite often much more open to, to therapy themselves. Yeah. Yes, um, as Liz just said, wonderful volunteer family connections leaders. She said you can write to your local health minister to um, try to raise more awareness for the under-resourced CPD um, system. It's uh, very, it's very sad to see. It's, it is one of the most under-resourced uh, health conditions that we have in the community. Yeah, yeah. we probably need to get a... I was thinking we need to get one of those change.org petitions up or something like that. But oh, yes. If anyone knows how to set one up, you know... Get in contact know. with me. <laughs> yeah, write it, set it up, and, yeah. uh, and I'm sure Belinda will be happily, happily um, yes. send it out. But, you know, it, it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, BPD, NEA BPD for the whole of Australia has two part-time paid employees for the whole of Australia so you know it's oily rag stuff that's right okay um all right oh good I'm glad people don't feel alone that's great mm. that's why we're here yeah okay thank you so much everyone thank you Jenny hope that thank you, you uh, got some nice little skills to go on with and, and practice in your families. Yeah. I might wait and debrief with you, Belinda, if we can. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Is Liz still on or is she gone? Um, uh, it looks like she's done. Megan looks like she's here though. Megan is here. Yeah. My co co host, and she can unmute herself if she's still here. 
we'll put everyone else in the waiting room. Everyone else will be going into the waiting room now. Thank you so much. I don't know if Megan is here. Megan, are you here? Maybe just her phone. Maybe just her phone. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. It was so amazing. It was really it was useful. Yeah, it was really good. It was really good. Yes, yes. I'm actually looking forward to re-watching it. I got a lot, but I was also like managing chatties and and things like that. But uh, yeah. just thank you so much for your time. Well, it's you don't know. I mean, you don't know if you, you know if people feel like you're teaching the suck eggs or you know. No, um, actually, we should stop recording. Let's stop recording. Yes. <laughs>